Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Fatima, and I'll be conducting this workshop on what they don't tell you about tech interviews. Um, so yeah, a little bit about myself. I work as a software engineer at Yelp. Um, I've been at Yelp for about like nine-ish months now, so it's pretty recent. And it was actually my move over to Yelp that inspired this workshop because as I was going through technical interviews, interviews myself, I felt that there's a lot more that goes into your success in a technical interview other than just the technical knowledge that you bring in, right? So I'm sure that like, you've seen there's there's more than enough conversation that happens around technical interviews right but i noticed that most of that conversation is around like the technical knowledge that you need to bring in for a, for a technical interview um so like you know what like you know what data structures you should know what algorithms you should know um but again as i was going through interviews myself i i realized that there's a lot of other factors other than just the knowledge that you bring in that really contribute towards your success in a technical interview and that's essentially what inspired this workshop. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm going to shed some light on um, in this workshop. Uh, just a disclaimer before we move ahead that I'm not representing Yelp here. So any opinions or views that are expressed in this workshop are held exclusively by myself. Uh, so this is what the workshop is, uh, is going to look like. We're going to go very chronologically. So I'm going to start you off from like the very beginning, you know, when you're just reaching out to recruiters, you're applying to jobs all the way to the very end where let's say you're trying to decide between multiple offers and you're thinking about things like compensation and negotiation. Um, so to start off in the pre-interview stage, I'm not going to talk about like the prerequisites. So I'm assuming that you have that down. I'm not going to talk about what like a good resume looks like. Um, I want to talk more about just the art of networking during COVID because COVID has undoubtedly really changed the recruiting landscape, right? So obviously before the pandemic hit, we were used to in-person interactions and that included in-person interactions with our recruiters as well. So, you know, you would meet your recruiters, like, you know, they would either come to your university campuses for info sessions, or you would meet them through like hackathons or, you know, conferences and things like that. Um, and, you know, what that typically looked like was that, you know, you would go up to a recruiter, introduce yourself, hand them your resume and kind of go from there. But obviously, like, because of the pandemic, we don't really have the luxury of in-person interactions all the time. Um, so how do you go about networking in this virtual world that we live in now? Um, and to get us started, I'm going to first talk about your elevator pitch. Now, an elevator pitch is this brief introduction that you prepare for yourself. And as the name implies, it should be effective enough to catch somebody's attention in the same amount of time as an elevator ride. So ideally, it should be short and sweet, but effective nonetheless. Um, now, a couple of tips for your elevator pitch. Um, first of all, please be genuine. I think that if you're genuine, your enthusiasm and passion really shows. And I also say this because keep in mind that recruiters deal with a lot of people on a daily basis. So they're pretty good at figuring out whether or not someone is or isn't being completely honest about either their past experiences or their skill set. So I think it's always better if you just, you know, just straight stay true to who you are and what you're bringing to the table. Um, secondly, ex express genuine interest in the company, like sit down and really think about why you want to work for a particular company. Um, is it the engineering culture that really excites you? Is it the product itself that really excites you? Is it the culture of innovation, mentorship? Whatever it is, I really encourage you to think about this question early on in the process for a couple of reasons. One, this is a fairly typical question that you can be asked in, in your interviews, right? Like your recruiter is for sure going to ask you this question. And then even in later parts of the interview process, this, this question is bound to come up. So I think that, you know, the earlier you get started, uh, the, the just the better it is. Um, secondly, as someone who's conducted a lot of interviews myself, I can tell you that I've come across so many candidates that come into interviews having no clue what the company does. Um, and as someone who's sitting at the opposite end of the table, it just, it, it absolutely, absolutely does not reflect positively on you. It just makes you seem very like disinterested in the whole thing. Um, it tells me that like, you know, your heart really isn't in this. Uh, it, it tells me that, you know, you probably just saw the opening by my company and you just went ahead and applied and you didn't really give it a second thought. I'm probably just like another statistic for you. Um, so yeah, it doesn't reflect uh, on you as, as the candidate very well. It doesn't tell me that, you know, why it is that you're particularly interested in, in, you know, in, in this company. 
Um, now, when I say that, do your research about the company, by no means am I saying that, you know, you need to know what their last quarter's EPS earnings were, but like at the very least, go to their website, read up on their mission statement, read up about their values, just so you have some idea. Um, I can tell you how I personally like to answer this question. So assuming that I'm applying to uh, a software engineering position, I like to talk about three different things in my response to this question. So in the first part of my response, I'll talk about the technical appeal of the company. So if I were to join this company, how would they help me improve my technical skill set as a software engineer? Um, in the second part of my response, I talk about the cultural appeal. So is there anything about their culture that I particularly like? So, you know, that's what I talk about. And then in the third part of my response, I talk about particular initiatives that the company might have taken in the past or, you know, is currently working on that I really like or, you know, that really resonate with me. Now, I do like to tell people that the third part you can kind of con consider optional because obviously this this is the part where you need to like really dig into into a company, into their past, things that they've done. But I do think that if you do the third part really well, it just shows, it reflects very positively on you and it just shows me how uh, how, it just shows the level and the depth of your interest in a company. So to give you an example, when I was interviewing with Yelp for the third part of my response, I said that I really liked the way Yelp responded to small businesses when the pandemic hit. So yeah, something to uh, keep in mind. Um, moving on, now on this slide, you see two screenshots. These are personal messages that I sent out uh, when I was, uh, you know, I was looking to change my job. Um, now, the whole motivation behind this slide is to basically demonstrate to you how you should tailor your approach based on the person it is that you're reaching out to. Now, when you're looking for a job, obviously there's, you know, you're going to be reaching out to recruiters, but then you could also be reaching out to uh, people uh, that, you know, that you, you've you known in the past. So people that you went to school with, um, you know, former colleagues, things like that, right? Now, the way that you approach these people should ideally look very different. Now, I'll start off with the, with the screenshot on the left. So that's a message that I sent to a recruiter on LinkedIn. Um, and as you can see, it's like, it's very brief. It's very to the point. Now, I think that as far as recruiters are concerned, it's perfectly fine for you to be very straight to the point. You don't need to like sugarcoat your message. You don't need to beat around the bush. Just get straight to what you're trying to tell them or ask them. Um, I do tell people that uh, whenever you're reaching out to a recruiter, just make sure that your message is like very crisp and very to the point, very well structured. So a rough template that I can suggest to you is that start off by introducing yourself, then mention the exact opening or the exact posting that you're interested in. Um, if you can include a link to it, that's even better. Please don't ever send a message to a recruiter saying, oh, could you tell me like what what open opportunities there are at your at your company don't do that all like every single company posts their openings on like their career website so you should you should be able to go look at the list there and then um you know make your message very specific um I've had a lot of people reach out to me like that in the past and it's just it doesn't reflect positively on you right like it's just telling me like I, I would expect that you as the candidate, this is the homework that you need to do, right? Like this is the research that you need to do. Um, so yeah, just make sure that you've done it before you actually go talk to someone. Um, so yeah, so mention the exact opening or the exact posting that you're interested in, include a link to it, that's even better. Then quick, just quickly talk about why you think you would be a good fit for that opening. And then lastly, always include your resume for uh, future reference. So I think that's like a good enough, a solid enough template for you to stick to if you're talking to a recruiter. Now, coming to the screenshot on the right, I do think that as far as people within your network are concerned, so, you know, you know again, these includes uh, friends, former colleagues, people that you went to school with, I do think that your approach should be a bit different because ultimately you share a different sort of a relationship with these people. So, you know, you don't want to make them feel like you're just using them as a means to an end. Um, so as awkward as that can be, like, you know, let's say you went to school with someone five years ago, you haven't talked to them in five years and, you know, all like, you you find out that oh they're working at a company that you're really interested in now it, i i completely understand that it can be very awkward when you're reaching out to someone like that you know when you know you you haven't stayed in touch and whatnot but i think that a good way of kind of breaking the ice is just reach out to that person um and just ask them if they'd be okay having like a virtual coffee chat with you right you can mention that oh i don't know if you remember me we went to school together um i noticed that you work as uh xyz at company xyz i was hoping that we could you know have like a virtual coffee chat 
Um, I think that's the, like that's always a great way to break the ice. And then in that conversation, when you do have a chat with them, ask them about their role, ask them about what they do, about about their company, things that they like, dislike about the company, things like that they like, dislike about their role. Just make that conversation about them. Okay. Um, try to like not try to actually express interest in in their role in their company. Um, also, I say this because like generally people like talking about themselves. So I think this is always a great way to get the conversation flowing. And then, you know, once once you've kind of, you know, once you've kind of broken the ice, you can slowly maneuver the conversation in uh, towards like asking them to refer you for, uh, you know, whatever opportunity, opportunity at their company. Um, also keep in mind that these people are the best opportunity that you will have to get to know both the pros and the cons of working at a given company. Now, now a recruiter on the other hand might not Share, like the challenges that the company is is facing or working on right and again that's very understandable that's a big part of their job like a recruiter wants to attract the biggest candidate pool as possible right so obviously they're only going to showcase like one side of the of the coin to you but like people who, who are working at the company um it, there's a greater chance that they'll give you a very uh like a very honest insight into what it is to work at a given company so again, just something to be uh, mindful of. Um, then another very popular question that I get is how many jobs you should be applying to. Um, sadly, there's no magical number. I wish there was, but I do have a couple of tips as far as this is concerned. Um, first of all, I would really encourage you to harness the power of platforms like LinkedIn, Glassdoor, etc. I personally use both of these platforms very successfully. I got my uh, I got an internship off of Glassdoor, and then I got my most recent job off of LinkedIn. Um, honestly, in my in my most recent job, and I didn't even use Glassdoor. You, I just stuck to LinkedIn. I personally prefer it. Um, uh, and also, also because between all these different platforms you'll see a lot of overlap in the posting so i think it's okay if you just stick to like one of them um secondly as far as just the process of applying to jobs is concerned there's no denying that that process is extremely boring like i am yet to meet someone who's who's who who, ha, who would tell me that oh i love applying to jobs it's the most interesting thing in in the world it's not i can assure you it's a very boring it's a very redundant monotonous sort of a process a process because all you're doing is is you know you're going through job postings you're fine like you know shortlisting the ones that you're interested in or you think you might be a good fit for and you're just filling out the same fields over and over again, uploading your resume repeatedly. So it can very, very quick, you know, very, very, uh, very quickly get very boring, very tedious and very overwhelming as well. So just as far as that process is concerned, I've kind of experimented with both ends of the spectrum in the sense that I've been the person who used to sit down every Sunday and I would go through like thousands and thousands of postings and then apply to the jobs that I was interested in. I think this way of going about it is very, very inefficient and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, when you're going through that many job postings, you're not going to be done within an hour, right? It's likely going to take you a couple of hours. And also there's a pretty good probability that you might skip out on a couple of really good job, job postings. Um, so yeah, so I think I would not recommend this way to anyone. What I did instead was that I kind of incorporated this into like a part of my daily routine. So every day I used to set aside anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes where I would just apply to jobs. Okay. Now, because once you start doing this every day, you you can just apply like a filter. Like on LinkedIn, they have a filter that allows you to uh, basically filter out jobs that were posted within like the last 24 hours or like a week or maybe a month. Just do that. Obviously, that list isn't going to be as long. Quickly go through the jobs and apply for the ones that you're interested in. Now, this approach has a couple of benefits. One, obviously, because you're this is something that you're doing every day, it really takes the pressure off of, off of this activity as well, right? And then secondly, because you're time boxing yourself, you're telling yourself that, okay, every day I'm not going to spend more than 30 to 5, 45 minutes on this process. It's just a lot more efficient use of your time. Um, so again, I would definitely recommend this uh you know this way of going about it as opposed to you sitting down once in a blue moon and you know getting overwhelmed by the sheer number of jobs that you have to go through um okay so now we're going to talk about the actual interview process um and to get that started i'm going to first give you an overview of what the standard interview structure is at least as it applies to like quote unquote big tech companies 
Um, like I'm talking about like the fangs here. Um, obviously this can look very different for medium sized companies or smaller companies or startups, but you know, you'll have you'll see common elements in all of them. Um, so uh it all starts off uh, off with a recruiter reaching out to you with either a phone screen or an online coding assessment. Um in some cases, you can also get a take-home assignment. Now, personally, I really, really dislike take-home assignments. I think that the amount of effort that you put into them is absolutely not worth what you get out of it. Uh, but, you know, just so you're aware. Um, usually, honestly, I've only seen, like, startups or, like, very small companies give out give take-home assignments. Like, usually all these big companies like to stick to, like, they have very refined interview processes. So, like, they like to stick to their traditional phone screens or, like, online coding assessments. Um, then depending on the outcome of the first round, there can be a small behavioral round following this. Um, this is usually conducted with an engineering manager, and the purpose of this is to assess a cultural fit. Um, and then lastly, there is your on-site. Um, now, in the pre-pandemic world, the on-site was the part where the company used to fly you out to their headquarters, and you'd basically spend an entire day in interviews. Um, but obviously in the virtual world that we live in now, this is also conducted virtually. Uh, this can be anywhere between four to five hours. It varies a lot by company. It's a combination of technical, behavioral, and system design rounds. There can be anywhere between two to three technical rounds, one system design, and one to two behavioral rounds. Now, I want to make a couple of clarifications here. Uh, this, like what you see on the slide, the description that I have for the on-site, this is for like full-time interviews okay so when you're interviewing for a full-time role that however that does not mean that this is you're not going to get like you know multiple rounds even for internships so even for internships at like fan you're definitely going to have multiple rounds of interviews yeah the length of it might be a bit shorter you might not have to do like you know uh four or five hours worth of interviews but you're, there's definitely going to be multiple rounds of interviews but yeah i'm just giving you this example so uh you're very well aware um, yeah, like, and then, like I said, it varies a lot by company. So to give you a couple of examples, my onsite with Amazon with, was five hours long. There were five rounds in total. Each round was 45 minutes and I would get like a 15 minute break between each round. Um, then within each round, the first 10 to 15 minutes would be spent on behavioral questions. And then the rest of the time was spent for technical questions. However, uh, I've also interviewed with other companies where, you know, uh, they've had like dedicated rounds that were either technical or behavioral in nature. So like you can see a lot of variation, right? Like you can get like hybrid rounds, which is a combination of both, or you can get like dedicated technical or behavioral rounds. Um, another thing that I want to mention at this point is that uh, your onsite is obviously a very grilling sort of an experience, right? Uh, it is for everyone. There's no denying that. Now, not every company does this, but uh, something that I do want to mention is that some companies might give you the option to split your onsite across two days. So that's something that Twitter did when I was interviewing with them. Like they gave me the option to either do my onsite in like one go, or I could split it across two days. Again, not every company might give you this option, um, but if you're like, you know, if let's say you're very concerned about your, uh, your onsite, you're feeling very overwhelmed or you have any sort of other con concerns, this is definitely something that you can bring up to your recruiter. Um, speaking of your recruiter, your recruiter is essentially your, your point of contact throughout this entire process. And before you're on site, they'll inform you of the structure of the interview, the duration, names of the interviews, et cetera. Basically that entire process, you know, from the very beginning, when you submit your application all the way to the very end, where you, when you hear back about whether or not you got the, the job is all done by your recruiter. Um, and then, uh, yeah, before you're on site, they'll set up a chat with you uh, to give you an opportunity to ask questions. And at this point, I like really encourage you to ask them anything that will put you at ease during the interview. OK, so like you can ask them about like how the technical rounds would be conducted. Are you expected to write production level code or a pseudo code? OK, uh, what kind of platform will they be using? Like something like HackerRank or CoderPad? Or can you use like an IDE of your choice? I know that in some interviews, they like I think it was like a startup that I was interviewing with and like they didn't really have a, like a very refined sort of an interview process so like the interviewer just asked me to like share my screen and no code on notepad so again I think it's always better um if you're aware of of this before you actually go in for your interview 
Um, then you can ask them when you can expect to hear back after the interview uh, for your system design rounds. Again, you can ask them like, how will those be conducted? So like what kind like of a platform would, would you be using? Uh, I, I know a lot of companies use like the Google Jamboard for system design interviews. So, you know, will can you use that or can you just write things down on your own notepad and then kind of hold it up for your interviewer to see? Um, and then you can even ask them what level you are being considered for. And the reason why I include this last uh, this last question is because a lot of the times you will see that for software engineering postings online, they'll have like a very generic looking posting. Like they'll say they're oh, they're oh we're just looking for software engineers. They won't really specify what level. Um, and the reason why companies do this is because usually companies have openings across like a wide variety of engineering levels, right? Um, so what they do is, is that they put out this generic looking posting and then based on the candidate pool and the results of their on sites, they assign the level that they think the candidate is best suited for. So again, to give you an example, when I was interviewing with Twitter, I was being considered for both the new grad and the level two engineering role. Um, the level two engineering role is the one right after the new grad role. Um, and again, that was contingent on the results of my onsite. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about the two major parts of technical interviews, the behavioral part and the technical part. I'll start off with the behavioral part. Um, now, I have a very interesting history as far as behavioral rounds are concerned, because for the longest time, I used to really, really underestimate behavioral rounds. Like in my head, I used to think that, oh, this is like the easy part of the whole interview process. And, you know, like I shouldn't be, like, I shouldn't like really spend so much time and energy preparing, preparing for them. At the end of the day, it's just a conversation that you're having with your interviewer. So like, how bad can it really be? And why on earth should I prepare to have a conversation with someone, right? Um, let me tell you right off the bat that that is an extremely, extremely misguided way of going about it. Um, your behavioral interviews are as important as your technical interviews. Please do not make the same mistakes that I did. Please do not underestimate them. Please don't take them, uh, you know, like don't approach them carelessly. Don't think that, oh, in, in, like in your head, it, in your head, like it's, I think as candidates, it's very difficult to be objective about ourselves. I think that at least for myself, I used to really overestimate how good I was in behavioral interviews. Um, so yeah, so please don't make the same mistakes that I did. Um, yeah, so to start off, the list that you see here, this is just, uh, you know, these are just questions that I've historically been asked. And again, just questions I've seen based off of the research that I've done. These are some very, very typical questions that you can expect to be asked. Uh, you don't need to like, take a picture or anything, I'll share the slide deck once we're done. But yeah, these are some very, very typical questions, very standard questions that you can expect to be asked. Um, and I would suggest that, you know, to start off, if you've never done interviews yourself, just make sure that you're able to answer everything on the list that you see here. Um, a couple of tips as far as your responses to behavioral interviews are concerned. Um, first of all, please be honest. Don't fabricate experiences because you will most likely be caught. It's okay to do minor modifications here and there, but please don't share something that's completely fictitious. And the reason why I say that is because interviews always, always ask follow-up questions. Okay. So let's say that I'm I like, you know, I I am the interviewer and I ask you a question. You you share something that you haven't really thought through, you just came up with it on the spot, and you know, you shared it with me as your response. Now, what I'm going to do is is that I'm going to listen to your response and then I'm going to pick up at like specific elements from your response and I'm going to ask you about it, okay? So in that follow-up cross-examination that happens, um, I'll be able to figure out whether or not, you know, you, if I'll be able to figure out whether or not you're being honest, okay? So if you're, sh if you've shared something that, you know, uh, you completely fabricated in that follow-up cross-examination, I'll, you'll, you, you probably won't be able to answer my questions as well, Right. Um, so yeah, so don't do that again. It's just like dishonesty in an interview is just an absolute, absolute no, no. It's a huge red flag. Um, secondly, be a good storyteller. Um, and one of the best ways to do it is to use the star format. I don't go into the details of the star format here, but this is like a very, very popular framework that's used within the tech industry to, uh, respond to behavioral questions. I would definitely encourage you to look, uh, look this up on your own time. 
Um, then for each category that I showed you on the previous slide, I always encourage people to prepare at least more than one experience. I know that as new grads, it can be it can feel very overwhelming to think about like multiple experiences where let's say you failed or multiple favorite projects of yours, right? Like it's very challenging to think to think about uh think think about these these questions and think and like reflect back on experiences that you've had. Um, but I think that as far as your interviews are concerned, I think it's always better if you can have, if you go into your interviews, having like thought of multiple experiences and multiple scenarios that you can share with your interviewers. I think instead of like, you know, repeating, rinsing and repeating, um, it's just better if you can share like multiple experiences, because again, not only is the experience and the scenario going to be different, your learnings from that experience or that scenario will also be different, right? So I think it just, um, it just serves you uh, better overall. Um, next, show what you've learned from your experiences, even if they were failures. And I mentioned this specifically because I know that for a lot of candidates, people think that uh, questions where you're asked to talk about like a failure of yours or a time where you experienced a setback, they're meant to be trick, trick questions. They're not. I, I can assure you, they're not meant to be trick questions. They're not there to set you up to fail. Um, through these questions, the interviewer basically wants to see whether you're the kind of person who like reflects back on their experiences, okay? So like, think about it this way. What is a failure at the end of the day? Every failure that you experience, um, it, it gives you an opportunity to learn from, to go, grow from, right? And that is exactly what your interviewer wants to see um, and hear in your response. So whenever you're asked uh, a question of this nature, always remember three things that you want to mention. Obviously, talk about the experience, then talk about what you learned from the experience, and then lastly, talk about how you changed your ways moving forward from that experience. Because when you incorporate these three different aspects to your response, you're showing the interviewer that you've come full circle, right? Like, it's one thing to learn something from an experience, but it's a completely different thing to, like, internalize that, that learning and then to change your ways moving forward, right? Um, so that's it, like that's basically what you that's the arc that you want to show your interview. Um, if you're asked a question that you don't have an answer to right away, you can ask your interviewer if you can have one to two minutes to think about it. Now, um, I will say, though, that please keep in mind that interview rounds are anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour. So obviously, you don't want to be thinking about a question for five to 10 minutes at end. Even if you are, your interviewer will just move you on to be to the next question. However, if you do need like a couple of seconds to just kind of, you know, frame a response in your head, it's perfectly OK for you to take that time. Um, okay, so moving on to the technical parts of the interview. Now, like I said, the purpose of this workshop is not for me to tell you what data structures or what algorithms you should know for your technical interviews. I think there's more than enough. There's like a plethora of resources available online that can probably guide you a lot better than I can. Um, what I want to focus on is the optimal strategy that you should have for your technical interviews. Believe it or not, I, I know that for a majority of candidates, we go into technical interviews thinking that our success in a technical interview is all about whether we get the optimal solution, right? Whether or not it has the best space time complexity and all of that. And that could not be further from the truth. Um, there's a lot of other factors. There's a lot of other signals that you're giving as the candidate uh, that your interviewer is like being very watchful of. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. Um, first of all, please keep in mind that questions are kept purposefully vague and it's your job to clarify because being a software engineer uh, is not just about coding. Like you're not coding 24 seven. Um, there's a lot of other aspects to your job um, that, you know, that are very important. And again, that you're actively being tested for in a technical interview. And for example, one of one of those other aspects is your ability to do requirements gathering. So what that means is, you know, do you, how do you deal with vague specifications in the question? Um, do you ask clarifying questions or do you just like jump straight into the solution? So again, those are all things that you're actively being assessed on. So uh, something to keep in mind. Um, ask questions. Like I said, don't jump into the question without having clarified any assumptions. Uh, in a technical interview, please keep in mind that you absolutely do not have the liberty to make any sorts of assumptions. If you're even thinking of making an assumption, please run it by your interviewer. Okay. And I, I, I think that one of the best ways to kind of address this is like quickly just make a comment and write it down. Uh, because again, like 
your how well documented how well commented your code is it's just again it's a great testament to your communication abilities as a software engineer um next write down test cases specifically corner or edge cases and i say this very early on because i know that as again as software engineers we tend to have this horrible tendency to not think about testing until like the very end and like again even at the very end we just we dread testing right like we we don't enjoy it we want to delay it as like much as we can but in a technical interview you do not again you don't have the liberty to do that you need to show your interviewer that you're thinking about test cases even before you've started working on your solution okay um so yeah so again write down those test cases uh again i would say that quickly run them by your interviewer um and see what the expected test outcome should be because again doing this if you do this exercise you uh you're basically showing the interviewer again you're kind of getting the confirmation from the interviewer whether you've understood the question correctly right like you don't want to know understood understand the question incorrectly uh you know you haven't clarified any assumptions you're not really sure what the question means you jump right into the solution 40 minutes pass and you know at the 40 minute mark uh you realize that oh i I my my solution is completely incorrect because there were parts of the question that I didn't understand correctly. So again, doing like this is why I'm stressing on the importance of writing out test cases before you've started working on your solution. Um, communicate effectively, talk things out loud, discuss trade-offs, different strategies that you're considering, etc. Please don't be that person who you know once you get the question, you're just off in your corner, you're suddenly working on the solution. I can assure you that even if you have the most perfect solution in the world, you will not pass the interview round because the interviewer has no idea what your process is, right? Like they have no idea what your strategy was. They have no idea what kind of like trade-offs you decided between what different strategies you considered. And again, that is exactly what the purpose of technical interviews is, is that you're trying to showcase the interviewer your approach towards a technical problem, right? Um, so again, I think this is, if you take anything away from my workshop, please let it be this, this bullet point, like the importance, the sheer undeniable importance of communication in a technical interview. Um, I can tell you personally that I've been in a lot of interview rounds where I was nowhere near like the optimal solution. I was maybe like anywhere between like 60 to 80% there, but just because I was communicating very well, I followed all of these points. Like I thought about testing early on. I communicate, I communicated my, my strategy, my approach. Not only was I able to pass those interview rounds, but I actually got great feedback about those rounds as well. Um, so again, something to keep in mind. Um, if you're stuck, you can ask for help. Um, but again, I'll say that the caveat here is that you you can ask for help provided that you've been communicating well up to this point. If you've just been silent for the past 20 minutes, even if you ask for help, the interviewer will have no idea how to help you out, right? Because they don't know what you're struggling with. They don't know what strategy or what approach, what your approach has been so far. Um, so again, I think that one of the great benefits of effective communication is that just because the interviewer knows exactly what you're thinking and what your approach is, if they feel that you're going too off track, they'll actually stop you right there and they'll nudge you towards the right direction. So, you know, uh, ultimately you'll end up saving yourself a lot of time and time is of the essence in a technical interview. Um, next, not every interviewer will allow you to compile your code and see if the test cases pass. Um, and again, this goes back to the point that I was making earlier about testing. Now, I'm sure that you've all been in a situation where let's say like you're working on like a very challenging uh programming problem or like a very challenging lead code problem and like you're almost there but you still have a couple of test cases that are failing so what you do is is that you know you make a little change in your code and you hit the run button again you still have a couple of test cases that fail so you make another little change you hit the run button again and you just get into this loop of like making a change hitting the run button making a change hitting the run button now, I call this the abuse of the run button, and you could not under any circumstances do this within a technical interview because it just tells your interviewer that you do not have the debugging abilities to figure out what the problem with your logic is. And that secondly, you rely on automated testing to tell you what the problem is. Like in once you get to once you start working in like in, in like the industry and whatnot, you realize that like there's no such thing as 
like there is automated testing, but there's humans who write those tests. There's there's no machine who writes unit tests or integration tests. It's all humans. Like you as the developer, it is your responsibility as the engineer working on a task that whatever feature it is that you're working on, it's adequately tested. Um, so again, that you you want to show that in a technical interview, you want to show your interviewer that you know how to debug your code, right? Because like 90% of your time, once you once you're working as an engineer is spent on debugging. So that's a very, very important skill that you need to showcase within a technical interview. Um, so yeah, so going back to the optimal strategy that I was talking about, um, once you get the question, you're going to take your time to read the question. You're going to ask clarifying questions, well, like clarifying follow-up questions. Um, you're going to clarify any vague specifications in the question prompt, and you're going to clarify any assumptions, okay? Um, then you're going to think about testing. You're going to write out your test cases, particularly your corner or edge cases, and you're quickly going to work with your interviewer to see what the expected test outcome should be, because again, this is a testament to whether you've understood the question correctly or not. Um, only then can you start working on your uh, on your solution. Once you're done working on the solution, before you hit any sort of run or submit button, what you're going to do is, is that using the test cases that you identified earlier, you're going to step through your code line by line. I am not exaggerating. You're going to step through it line by line because you're going to see when you start stepping through it line by line, you're going to see how like how the different variable values are changing and whatnot, right? And then again, but when you step through it line by line, you might also pick out on a couple of like syntax issues or you know things like that. Um, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, right now, you might think that, oh, like stepping through my code line by line won't be too bad. I'll do it. Like once I get to the interview, I'll do it. It won't be too bad. It's pretty bad. Like again, and I say this because in a technical interview, like it's a very high pressure sort of a situation, right? Um, so yeah, like stepping through your code line by line is is no joke. So I would encourage you that even when you're like prepping for your interviews in your own personal time, do that. Start, start trying to do that. Like for every every other question, step through your code line by line. Um, because yeah, again, it's it's a skill. It's not something that everyone just knows magically knows how to do. Uh, so yeah, so that's the that's the overall like that's roughly the strategy that you should um, stick to. Um, for your system design rounds, it's very important to draw diagrams or class diagrams of the question is about object oriented design. Now, I didn't get into the the details or the specifics of system design interviews in this workshop because one, uh, like specifically for like intern positions, you're likely not going to get like a design sort of a question. For new grad positions, you definitely will. Like it might not be like a full blown system design question, but you might get like a object oriented design question. Um, but yeah, so that's why I didn't really get into them. Um, because honestly, like I, I could have like a completely separate workshop just just about system design interviews, because they're a, a different beast altogether. But yeah, if you do have questions about them, um, I'm more than happy to chat about it um, after the workshop or even offline. Um, lastly, if you're very nervous about your technical interviews, I would advise you to watch real life technical interview videos. Um, now, this is something that I did, and I would highly, highly suggest it for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think that at this point, technical interviews have a reputation, right? Like they have a reputation of being like very scary and very challenging, very overwhelming. Like every time I open LinkedIn, there's like 20 different people talking about, you know, their different interview experiences. Some are good, some are bad. Um, so yeah, so like there's there's no denying that uh, you know technical interviews have a certain reputation at this point within the industry. And then secondly, I think that as candidates, something that we that we tend to do is that when we go into these interviews, we go in expecting perfection from ourselves. Like we go into these interviews thinking that we, if we're anything less than perfect, we're not gonna get that offer. And that could not be further from the truth because no one is expecting perfection from you in a technical interview or any interview for that matter. Um, you have to keep in mind that at the end of the at, at the end of the day, an interview is an interaction between two human beings. So by the very nature of that, there's bound to be like little issues here and there. There's bound to be little mistakes that you make here and there. And most of those mistakes are forgivable mistakes. Okay. So again, like I realized all of this once I actually started people in real life interview situations. So you know, a lot of people stutter when they're nervous. I do that. It's perfectly okay for you to do that. Um, it's okay to be stuck. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay not to have the right answer right away. Those are all very, very forgivable mistakes. 
Um, so yeah, so I think that like, you know, if you're feeling a similar sort of way, if you're very nervous, if you're feeling very overwhelmed about it, I would really encourage you to uh, to do that. Obviously, you know, like people always say that, oh, you should do mock interviews, definitely do that. But I think this is also a good way um, of kind of seeing other people and how they react uh, or operate within an interview setting. Um, okay, so this is the last and final part of the presentation. In the post-interview stage, I want to first quickly talk about how hiring committees work, because I think that, again, as candidates, we tend to have this horrible tendency to assume the worst after an interview, like just because we're not hearing back immediately, we'll, we'll start thinking that, oh, we've probably been rejected. Um, and that might not necessarily be true. Um, so yeah, so that's why I want to talk about hiring committees. So, um, what happens is, is that once you're done your interviews, your recruiter puts together this package for you that includes your resume, any quote that you submitted uh, in, you know, in the interview process, and then feedback from all the interviewers that met you uh, during your interviews. And then this package is sent over to the hiring committee, which makes the final decisions as to whether or not an offer is going to be extended to a candidate or not. Now, the frequency at which hiring committees meet can be very different based on the company. So for some companies, hiring committees meet as often as three times a week. So obviously with those sorts of companies, the turnaround time is going to be very quick. You're likely going to hear back within like one to two days of your interview. Um, but again, like, you know, the frequency, the meeting frequency can look very different uh, based on whatever company it is that you're interviewing with. So that's why there might be some gap between once you finish your interviews and then once you hear back about the results of your interviews. Um, this is like, I've given you like a very, very high level overview of, of this process. If, if this is something that you're interested in, definitely go read up about this on your own time. It's a very fascinating read. Google, for example, is very famous for how their hiring committees work. Um, now in case you're rejected, obviously that's not an outcome that any candidate wants, but, uh, I like, there is, there is definitely a professional way of addressing your rejection. Please don't be that person who, you know, reads the rejection email and then off to the junk folder, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, you have to act professionally, whatever, you know, irrespective of whatever the outcome of your interview is. Um, thank your recruiter. I think that's very important. Keep in mind that your recruiter is someone who's with Company policy allows you can ask them for feedback. Now, this is truer for smaller companies, um, but for bigger companies, uh, like bigger companies have explicit policies against giving feedback. So they'll just straight up tell you that we don't share feedback after interviews. But like smaller companies are usually pretty okay with it. just something that you can, um, you know, something that you can, uh, something to keep in mind if you're interested. Um, in case you accept the offer, that's perfect. You're done. Again, thank your recruiter, but please be mindful of other companies that you might have interviews scheduled with. Don't host them. Let them know of, you know, let them res respectfully let them know of your uh, decision. Um, in case you reject the offer, again, thank your recruiter. And I think that, like, you know, irrespective of whatever the outcome of your interview is, I think it's always better never to shut the door completely on a particular company. Unless, obviously, you saw some explicit red flags in your interviews with them, I think it's always better to propose staying connected for future opportunities because this way not only does your network continue to grow but you know the next time that you're in the job market you have some solid places to start from um so yeah just to kind of demonstrate this is an email that i sent out when i was uh to uh, yeah so uh, towards like the end of my interviews once i'd accepted an offer from yelp uh there were some other interviews that i had lined up but i was no longer obviously interested in interviewing with them so this is the email that i sent out um you know and it just has everything that i, I that i mentioned i thank them for their time um i tell them that i had a wonderful time meeting all of their engineers and that you know i would love to stay connected for um, future opportunities uh, okay, so lastly, we're just going to end this off by talking about compensation and negotiation, because obviously that's, that's the most fun part of this entire process. That's what, you know, everyone looks forward to. Um, so to get us started, I'm going to first give you an overview of what uh, the typical compensation pack like packages are like in te tech companies, because they can have a lot more components than what we're usually used to. 
Um, so yeah, so to start off, there's a base salary, and this is usually the most difficult to negotiate. I think a base salary is pretty standard. It's what, you know, a, everyone has a base, right? Then there's your restricted stock units or uh, RSUs. Now, this is basically, these are basically company shares, okay? But what you need to understand with your RSUs is that there is a vesting schedule or like a cliff uh, associated with these. So let's say that you're a candidate and I'm, you're signing a contract with my company. Um, I, uh, like in, in your contract, I tell you that I am granting you 100K worth of RSUs, okay? Now, what you need to understand is that once you've signed the contract, that absolutely does not mean that you now have 100K worth of company shares. It, it does not. What that means is, is that, um, okay, so before I get into that, keep in mind that companies follow a four-year vesting schedule. So what that means is, is that every year you'll have, you'll be granted access to 25% of the RSUs that were granted to you, okay? So going back to the example that I was talking about, um, after your first one-year mark of working at my company, uh, 25% of that 100K will be granted to you. Now, at this point, that, what, what that basically means is that you're going to be granted 25%. Uh, so, you know, 25K worth of shares will be granted to you. Um, at this point, like I said, they're just company shares. So you can choose to do whatever you want with them. You can sell them. You can, you know, choose to sell them at, uh, at a later time. That's completely up to you. But that's how RSUs work. So, and I, the reason why I wanted to clarify this was because, like, once you, when you see your contracts and you see, like, you know, huge amounts of RSUs, don't get too excited because you have to keep the vesting schedule in mind. Um, yeah, moving on, then there's a yearly bonus. Again, this is pretty standard. This is a set percentage of your base salary, and this is prorated. So uh, what that means is, is that if you worked at a company for half a year, your yearly bonus will be half of what it would have been if you had worked there the entire year. Um, from my experience, honestly, yearly bonuses can really, really vary based on kind of like the part of the industry that you're in. Um, so for example, I used to work at a trading firm earlier and like finance related firms are always kind of known for giving out huge yearly bonuses. Um, like, you know, especially if you work, you know, like how it is for like traders and whatnot, but yeah, usually for like the FinTech industry, yearly bonuses are considered like pretty huge. Like your yearly bonus can be as big as 10 to 20% of your base salary, which is, which is pretty big. Um, but again, I've also worked at other companies where the yearly bonus was as small as like two to 2.5% of your base salary. So yeah, there can be, a, you can see a lot of variation as far as the yearly bonus is concerned. Um, and lastly, there's a signing bonus um, again, and this is where you have the most room to negotiate. Keep in mind that your signing bonus is a one-time thing. You only get it when you sign your offer. Um, and if you leave before the first one-year mark, again, companies do this differently, but if you leave before the one-year mark, you have to give certain part of the, of the signing bonus back to the company. Um, then as far as research about compensation numbers is concerned, obviously talk to their, talk to your friends if they're comfortable sharing their packages. Then I always suggest that advice people to talk to friends across a wide variety of industries. Um, you know, talk to friends working in the same role as you, but like, you know, let's say talk to a friend who's working at a bank versus like a big tech company versus like say a hedge fund. I think it just gives you a much better idea of what the, you know, what the variation can be in terms of what the market uh, might be willing to offer you. Um, in terms of resources online, I actually wouldn't recommend Glassdoor because it can be pretty unreliable. I would recommend something like Levels.fii. I've personally used it and I highly, highly recommend it for a couple of reasons. Um, one, Levels breaks down the salaries for you into these different components that we talked about. So that's very useful. Then it also shows you how salaries differ based on location. So keep in mind that you could be working for the exact same company in the exact same team, but team, but you could be making something very different if you're, say, based in San Francisco versus Toronto versus London. So Levels offers you that sort of a transparency as well. And then lastly, it also shows you how salaries differ based on the level of engineering that you're at. So I think overall, like a highly, highly recommended resource. Um, then as far as just how to go about negotiating, first of all, please never accept an offer as soon as it's presented. Your recruiter will likely call you to discuss the compensation package. And at this time, you should just jot down the details, thank them and ask them for how long you have to accept the offer. Um, and this is because a lot of offers in tech are called exploding offers because you don't usually have a lot of time to accept the offer, usually maybe like a week or maybe 10 days. So it's always better if you have like a tentative timeline in mind. 
Um, if asked, never share a number or a range. I would recommend, like in this case, you can always respectfully decline to answer this question. You could just be like, hey, I'm not comfortable answering this question. Or um, like you, you can say something like, I, you know, I, it would be better if I got back to you if after having done a little research. So you can always decline answering this question. A better strategy is to actually flip the question on them and ask them for what the, what the, what the salary is for someone who's working in this role at their company. Okay. Um, then in terms of just how you should go about negotiating, I got a lot of advice in terms of that. So, you know, whether you should call your recruiter or whether you should email them. I think ultimately, obviously, it depends on what you're more comfortable with. I would say, I would say that if you're, if you're someone who's never negotiated before, um, I'd say an email is better. I think there's very few people who know how to negotiate so well that they can stand their ground on a phone call because recruiters, again, like by no fault of their own recruiters, this is a big part of their job, right? Um, so they can be very persuasive. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're not sure in your ability to negotiate, just go with an email instead. That's what I did, by the way. Um, in your follow-up conversation, always thank the, always thank your recruiter for extending the offer to you. And at this point, you should have concrete numbers ready um, and mention any competing offers or deadlines. However, please never lie to a recruiter about comp competing offers or compensation because not only are recruiters very well connected, they can also ask you to submit proof of competing offers or compensation. Um, and lastly, recruiters really like it if you could wait that you will be ready to sign the contract immediately if they can get to your proposed numbers. And just to kind of demonstrate all the tips that I've shared, um, this is an email that I sent out when I was trying to negotiate. Yes, I was uh, successful in negotiating. So you're absolutely free to use this email template if you want. Um, before we end things, I always get two very typical questions as far as negotiation is concerned. One, people ask me if you should negotiate for your internships. And then secondly, people ask me if you should negotiate, even if you don't have any competing offers. And to both those questions, I say absolutely yes. Um, first of all, there's no rule anywhere that says that you can only negotiate for your full-time offers. Um, I've, I've helped my younger brother negotiate for two of his internships very successfully. So you should absolutely, absolutely try to negotiate even for your internships. Um, secondly, as far as competing offers are concerned, um, Obviously, having a competing offer definitely tilts the whole thing in your favor, right? But again, it is absolutely not a guarantee that your negotiation is going to be successful. Like you could have 10 competing offers, but if a company isn't willing to give you a higher salary, they'll just straight up tell you no, okay? So the absence or presence of a competing offer should never stop you from trying to negotiate. <clears throat> and then just to just wrap this whole thing off, I know negotiating can be a very scary experience for a lot of people. It was for me. <clears throat> What's actually funny is that I knew about the importance of negotiation ever since like second year of my university. I had a lot of like mentors and whatnot and, you know, all like four years of university, they like drilled into me that, yeah, you need to negotiate, learn, start trying how to, learning how to negotiate. It's a very important skill. If you don't negotiate, you're leaving money on the table all of that. But when I got to my first full-time offer, um, when I got to that stage, I just chickened out. Like I got so scared and I was just so unsure of myself, so underconfident, so unsure of what I was bringing to the table and whether or not I deserved getting like a higher salary. I just chickened out of the whole thing. I didn't even try once. And I cannot tell you how badly I regretted it for the next two years of working at that company. So yeah, always, always try to negotiate. The absolute, absolute worst thing that can happen if you try to negotiate is that the company will say no. That's it. That's the absolute worst thing that can happen. They won't retract your offer just because you're trying to negotiate a higher salary. So again, don't that, let that fear ever stop you from trying to negotiate. Um, keep in mind that at the end of the day, like anything else, negotiation is a skill. Uh, like I said, it's not something that you're magically going to know how to do once you get to your full-time offer. So like the earlier you get started, the, uh, the better it is. Um, but yeah, that is the end of my workshop. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them right now. Um, otherwise, if you just want to have a chat or you want to practice mock interviews, get feedback on your resume, you're more, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, you can reach out to me either by email or through my LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me here today. Perfect. Thank you, Farma. We have some questions in the chat. So the um, first question. Oh, okay. okay. 
Uh, oh. Yes. Yeah. So for the first one, they asked if you need to have like a three-part answer. No, 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 you, you don't. Obviously, for every single company, you, it's not really realistic to do that. But I would say that at least for the ones that like you really, really want to get into and you really want to make a great impression, I think that doing that, that research will definitely pay off. Uh, similarly, do we have to have coffee chats and ask for referrals with people that work at the company for every company we apply to? Okay, so you don't have to. In any all of the things that I've shared, you don't have to do anything. Um, I will say that as far as applying to jobs is concerned, there's three ways of going about it, right? There's a, just applying to a job opening. The other one is if you can get in touch with a recruiter at the company. And then the third one is if you can get a referral. Now, usually referrals are like the fastest way to just speed this whole process up for you, okay? Um, so yeah, like like I said, you don't have to get a coffee chat with someone and ask them for a referral. A referral is just a very, very effective way of getting your foot in the door. So if that's something that you're interested in, go for it. And regarding referrals, I, I was wondering uh, what would be better between reaching out to uh, recruiters or turn on employees for uh, referrals which one no, do you a think recruiter is the best? won't give you a recruiter won't give you a referral it's it'll be employees that give you a referral because that's a recruiter's job right so they can't yeah. refer you that that's that's their job their job is to uh basically get candidates into the pipeline so a recruiter would, would won't refer you employees of the company refer you okay perfect and we also had other questions from uh discords that people that couldn't come to the, the workshop uh, sure. What do you think is more important to focus on between the technical and behavioral skills or the networking part of uh, getting an internship or a job? Uh, and, how, and how could you, how should we split her, her, the effort that we give to uh, those two aspects? So Honestly, I'll be honest, I'm a huge introvert. So like network was always something that I used to be very, very scared about. And I just used to feel very awkward about it. Honestly, I think COVID was kind of useful in the sense that it just removed the in-person interaction component to it, right? So like it was no longer networking, no longer looked like like, you know, having 50 people in the room and then you going around the room and talking to each of those 50 people. Now, in like, you know, again, in this virtual world that we're in, networking looks like sending someone a LinkedIn message, right? Or like a connection request and like, you know, having like a nice personalized note with it and things like that. So um, I would say that it's, uh, I would say ultimately, obviously it's your, it's your performance in the interview that, that is, that is, that's paramount, right? That is what is going to make or break the the whole um the whole thing for you um but i do think that yeah networking can pay off especially if you're not making headway um again like i said like when you just apply to a job uh through like a portal or something the timeline can be very very long like for some of for a lot of companies you might never hear back from them ever you might get a rejection like two years later that that's actually happened to me and, and it happens to a lot of people so I think definitely networking has that advantage that it's likely like, you know, it'll, like I said, it'll just speed up the process for you, like, especially like if you're chatting directly with a recruiter or if you've been referred by someone, you can always just ping that person two weeks later and be like, hey, I just wanted to follow up on the status of my application, things like that. Um, but I would say that obviously at the end of the day, it's your um, it's your performance in the interviews that will uh get you or won't get you that offer it won't be the networking that you did right like once you once you've been referred like that person exits the whole process like that person isn't going to come in and say that oh no forget that they weren't that good in their interviews i'm telling you that oh they deserve to have this job no it doesn't work like that like it's it's going to be your performance in the tech in the in your interviews that's going to get you that offer um so yeah i would say it if if it's a choice between the two, definitely focus more on your performance in the interviews. Super good answer. Uh, another question was, is it worth trying to network with people we don't know or maybe alumni of her school? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, like I said, that's like, uh, that's like, let's say you went to, there's, there were certain people that you went to school with, but like you haven't chatted with them or in, in a couple of years, or you didn't even like you, you saw them, you know, but you never really 
uh, had a chat with them, that's perfectly fine. Just like, you know, when you're reaching out to them, just be like, hey, um, I don't know if you remember me, but we went to school together from this year to that year, or I met you through this club or something like that, right? Even just saying that, oh, we went to the same school is like, is good enough. Um, and again, I would, like I said before, uh, try to have like a virtual coffee chat with them because in the, the first conversation you want to express your interest in them you want to express your interest in their company in their role make the conversation about them not about you right because it's it, this is a need that you have this is not a need that they have they're giving you time out of their day out of their schedule so be respectful of that and again you have to make the conversation about them get them talking about what they do about their company and things like that usually honestly you, people are pretty good at figuring out um when they're being approached for a referral uh like you don't have to hit them over the head with it that hey i want you to refer me like people usually know especially if it's being done through linkedin like it's pretty easy to figure that out um but yeah perfect super good answer uh, other question coming from me this time how easy or hard is it for a Canadian student to get an internship or a job in the U.S.? Uh, honestly, I went to Waterloo, so my answer might be a bit skewed because like half of Waterloo, actually more than half, goes to the U.S., right? Um, I would say as far as just the the knowledge aspect of his, of his, of it is concerned, it should not be a problem. If you're good enough, you'll get the job. And I'll say that, honestly, for any job in the world, I think that if you're good enough, if you're bringing the right required skill set to the table, you'll get the job. However, I will not comment on the logistical aspects of it, especially if there's like visa issues involved and everything. I know that because of the pandemic, a lot of these companies stopped sponsoring, uh, you know, like work visas and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to comment on that. But as far as just... Um, getting that offer is concerned absolutely if you have the required skill set why on earth would a company not want to hire you also another thing that I want to tell you is that a lot of the companies because of just how saturated the U.S. tech market has become and because of how crazy salaries have become a lot of companies have actually shifted their focus from the U.S. to Canada and the uh, U.K. markets um, so again you the the odds are uh tilted in your favor perfect thank you and finally how do you enjoy working at Yelp? i love it i'm so happy oh i i absolutely love it um yeah I, I i'll be like i'll hit my one year mark in october but yeah it's honestly it's an amazing amazing company uh to work at i would if you're interested, if you're at the at that stage, I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's a great set of people to work with. Um, they're all so talented. Um, you know, um, you get a lot of ownership over your projects, which is very scary, but it's very empowering at the same time. Um, they're all very inclusive. They make you feel a part of the team. Uh, there's so much technical knowledge uh, going around. There's they, they really encourage mentorship, like they're senior engineers that just, you know, that, that take you under their wing. And, you know, they're very, uh, they're very patient with you. I can definitely say that about myself, <laughs> that I've had all my senior engineers have been extremely, extremely patient with me. And I know that there's been times where I've tested their patience because I've, I've made like, you know, I, and again, everyone does it, uh, you know, you make stupid mistakes um especially when you're starting out but yeah they're very very forgiving very understanding very patient very encouraging uh very empowering like they push you to take you know work on bigger better projects they push you to uh not push you encourage you to like you know take on more responsibility um but they have all also yelp has an amazing work-life balance uh yeah it's i think it's one of the i think that's definitely the part that i enjoy most about working at yelp is that they have an amazing amazing work-life balance um honestly the last company that i was at that was my biggest like, problem with them was that i had no semblance of a work-life balance um i was just working 24 7 but um but yeah, no. So I'm to, in summary, I'm very, very happy 